Well, good morning, Southwest. It's good to see you all. And for those online, I wanted to take a moment to welcome you as well. We appreciate you tuning in. It's great to have you here. Um, we're just going to launch right into worship. So if you're comfortable standing, please stand and we'll begin. strength indeed is small a child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all cause Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he still white as snow Southwest, if you haven't noticed, today is different. It is Youth Sundays. Can we, can we just give it up for, uh, for our young, young people here? Way to go. <laughs> uh, I've been working on trying to get these guys to smile more because they're a little petrified, so it's okay to smile. It's all right. And just know this, I am the oldest thing you will see on the platform today. Wow, somebody was excited about that. Uh, can we get some ushers to take that individual out? No. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I might be wrong. The, the piano might be older than I am. Um, so so I, I may not be the oldest thing, but we are so glad you're here. Uh, we do believe here at Southwest to invest in the next generation. Without the next generation, the church will not exist. And so we will have more and more Sundays like this as we invest 
into the next generation because the gospel of Jesus Christ and his church will not stop. Uh, but it's up to us oldies to invest into the next generation uh, so that it continues to march on. So thank you. We're excited for, uh, for today. But as we prepare our hearts for worship, we'd like to do a couple things. We'd like to read scripture out loud and we'd like to pray uh, together. And so this being a new month, we're going to shift and focus our attention on Psalm 97. So as we prepare our hearts for worship, I would ask that you read with me Psalm 97. I will read the regular text. If you will join me with the bold text, I would appreciate it. As we prepare our hearts for worship, Psalm 97, the Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Please join me. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the peoples see his glory. All worshipers of images are put to shame who make their boast in worthless idols. Worship him, all you gods. Zion hears and is glad, and the daughters of Judah rejoice because of your judgments, O Lord. For you, O Lord, are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. O oh, you who love the Lord, hate evil. He preserves the lives of his saints. He delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and joy for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the Lord, O oh, you righteous, and give thanks to his holy name. So as we continue to prepare our hearts for worship, we'll move into a moment of silent prayer. And this is your time to commune with your heavenly Father. My encouragement to you is if you've walked into this room with unrepented sin, this is a good time to confess and repent of your sin. Get your heart right with God so that as we come to his word, we do so with joy and with gladness so that his word will transform us from the inside out. So let's just spend a few moments as a family in silent prayer to our Lord. Let's do that together. God, we come before you and we ask that you would forgive us when we put our pleasures in the things of this world rather than in, in you. Remind us this day that we are completely satisfied in you and in you alone and at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So God, we come into this space, into this time, not only to worship you, but to rejoice in you and to be filled with the joy that you can only give the human heart. And so as a church family, our prayer is that you would be honored today, you would be glorified. All that is said, all that is done would exalt the name of Jesus Christ. We thank you that today is a day for the young people. I pray that they would be built up in the vision that you have for each and every one of their lives as, as they use their gifts and abilities to worship you this day. God, we thank you that you will build your church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. So we worship you in spirit and in truth. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Join us as we continue to sing this morning.
house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Rain came, wind blew My house was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through I'm gonna make it through Cause I'm standing strong He was If the mountains were where you hide, oh, how far I'd scale the valleys if you grace the other side. Oh, how long have I chased rivers from lowly seas to where they rise? Against the rush of grace descending From the source of its supply Cause in the highlands and the heartache You're neither more or less inclined I would search and stop at nothing you're just not that hard to find. Oh. Shadow me through 
So as Arnie mentioned, uh, this is a youth-led service, and so I just wanted to take a moment at the end here to kind of appreciate them again. They picked the songs, the youth picked the songs, the youth have been helping with everything. Um, they kind of picked the arrangements. Um, they did a lot throughout this whole thing, and so they've been a huge help and blessing, and I'm very grateful that they were willing to share their gifts with everybody this morning. Um, I also know that... I say it's a mostly youth-led service, but I also know that to most of you, I am counted as a youth. So I will include myself in that. I said something similar first service, and then I emphasized especially in this service, and I don't think the reaction was what I wanted. So we're gonna just pretend that didn't happen, but one more time, I'd like to give it up for them for helping this day. As soon as I walked up, everyone stopped clapping. Well, welcome to Southwest. Uh, 
it, whether you're here in person or you're watching online, thank you for choosing to join us this morning as we worship God together. My name is Lawson Pagano. I'm 17 years old. I'm currently a junior at Columbine High School, and I love this church. It's so cool to be here with my friends and my family and just interact socially with everyone. And at this church, that reflects that. We At the church, we value relationships, so, and one way we do that is to meet new people and connect with those who sit near you. So I would invite you to take a few moments, turn to those around you, and say hi. If you don't know them, introduce yourself. I always feel so bad interrupting this. Well, as you're finding your seat, I'd like to bring your attention to the registers that are currently being passed out by the students. It's, please take a moment to fill them out. They're a way we get to know you and know that you're here. And also, at the bottom of it, there's a bunch of lines that you can fill out prayer requests. And I know, I need prayer a lot, like if, for example, I have a test on Thursday, or I need prayer to have conviction to study for that test. But whatever you need, prayer or praises, I know that our staff would love to pray for you, so write those in the little lines at the bottom. And I also have a few announcements. First is adopt a student. As a church, we like supporting our college students who call Southwest their home and invest in them. One way you do that is through our adopt a student program. If you are a family who would like to adopt a student or a student who would like to be adopted, then please sign up in the Welcome Center or online at, at, through the church website or the weekly, weekly email. I know that as a student, having someone to say, hey, stop messing around and steady is pretty good. So I know that I definitely appreciate it. Second is Project Serve. On September 23rd, we have an opportunity as a church to serve our community together. Join for a fun afternoon as we accomplished a variety of projects in this local community here. And because here at Southwest, we want to be a community church that is for the community. That's why we put it in the name. So please sign up, again, Welcome Center, or online to the weekly email or website. And for those who sign up, there will be brec breakfast provided beforehand and a free t-shirt. So, I mean, that's like a good thing right there. So, like, you know, you're, you're serving God, but I mean, free t-shirt, let's be honest. That's pretty good too. And lastly, we have a new second hour programming option. Uh, kindergarten through fourth grade. It's intended to engage families as they decide to make Southwest their home. We seek to provide an on-ramp for children more e to more easily participate in Sunday mornings and grow towards worshiping together as families during the service. If you're interested, please see Pastor Than in uh, the ministries department. He's the guy with the beard and the glasses and the loud voice, so you'll probably be able to f hear him. Uh, but as we continue in worship through the preaching of God's word, I invite you to watch this video. Good morning, Southwest family. It is so good to be with you all this morning and to worship our God together. My name is Scott Riley, and I serve as the director of student ministries here at Southwest Community Church, which means I have the great privilege to work with our high school and middle school students, many of you, them that you see today. 
I did want to say thank you to all of our students this morning who have helped within our service and served in many different capacities. But today isn't just a special Sunday for them. You can actually find them serving all throughout our church in all the different ministries that we have on a weekly basis. And so uh, keep your eyes out for them. And I just wanted to say thank you to them and their families as they make serving a priority within our church. I've been attending Southwest for about three years now, and I truly, truly consider this place my home. And as of this past July, I got married to my beautiful wife, Andy, who's over here. And we are so grateful for the church family we have here, their encouragement, their prayers, and continual love that, the, that you guys show us as we jump into this new season of our lives. I did want to bring your attention to a few resources that we have in the service today. One is our family worship packet, which is available to our children or parents who have children in the service today. And this is a great way for our children to participate with us within the service and also follow along with our passage. We also have a worship guide that's available to everybody else, and this goes through a lot of the things that are coming up on our church calendar and ways that you can get involved. And on the flip side of that page, there's, a, there's sermon notes for you guys so you can follow along with the passage. So if you did not get one of these as you came in or as you went through the Welcome Center, please raise your hand and someone, one of our students, will be glad to give you one of those. Over the last few weeks, we have had s- several staff members share passages of scripture that have greatly impacted and transformed their lives. As you saw up on the screen in the video, this series is called Truths That Transform. And I'm excited to continue this series with you and share a passage that has radically transformed my life. Contrast. Contrast. We hear this word often as it relates to something that is strikingly different or in opposition to something else. We also see this in forms of artwork or media. Just take any modern film and you will see contrast. It's what makes a foreground stand out from a background. It's what differentiates characters within a group. It's what informs us that a mood is changing or something is about to happen. I don't know if I have any fellow fans in here, but I'm a Star Wars guy. Any Star Wars people out there? Sorry, Trekkies. Uh, Since I was young, I have always loved Star Wars. I read the books. I've watched the movies. I had the Legos. I had the action figures. I even dressed up as characters for Halloween, and I still do. Uh, And to be honest, I still love Star Wars. Yeah, this is a lightsaber, but no, it is not real. You can touch it. You won't chop your arm off. I wanted to prove that I was actually a Star Wars fan. But Star Wars thrives at contrast. Just look at some of the pictures up on the screen. Without knowing much about Star Wars, you are quickly able to identify the good guys versus the bad guys, the light versus the dark, the good versus the evil. And honestly, it's just really cool when you see some of these epic battle scenes and all the contrast in them. And get this, the creators of Star Wars knows that this contrast will impact you a certain way. They know that as they create the contrast between characters, sides, and themes, you will be drawn towards the good characters as they uh, portray heroic and virtuous qualities. And you will be repulsed by the bad characters, their vices, and evil pursuits. We see similar contrast within the Bible. We see this throughout many of the stories within the Bible, but a place I have found it to be greatly recognizable is within the book of Psalms. Specifically, we see an immediate contrast within Psalms 1 between the righteous and the wicked. And David writes this psalm 
Not just to inform us that there's two characters at work in the story, but that there's a difference between them. And that one is far greater than the other. And of these contrasting identities, a life in pursuit of God and his word should be far more desired. So as we begin looking at Psalm 1, I want to ask some questions to you all. You don't have to answer, but just think, think about these. What do you delight in? What brings you the most happiness? What do you get really excited about? Just as Eric challenged us last week in 2 Corinthians 5.17 to examine what we are putting our hope in, our strength, our purpose, our identity, today we look at what we put our delight in. There are many things we can wrongly place our life around that claim to bring life and fulfillment but will leave us empty and wanting more in the end. And scripture reminds us of where our delight should be and why. As a kid working through middle school and high school, I found myself wrestling with these same exact questions. I was a young person who had given my life to Jesus at an early age, and as I walked through those awkward yet scary years of public school, I was constantly met with a myriad of questions like this. What should I be interested in? What should I pursue? How should I live my life? And where and how should I spend my time? Being a young Christian, I knew what God desired of me. But when it came to living that out, it was so hard to be the odd one out. The one going against the grain. That church kid who always followed the rules. You see, we live in an age where our delight is constantly being fought over. It might be a hobby. It might be a product that you can buy. It might be a relationship. We are constantly being told that our delight should be in something other than God. Can you think of anything like this in your own life? Where you are being pulled away to delight in something other than God. For me, it was my senior year of high school where I began to have some success as a wrestler. I know it doesn't look like I was a wrestler. My mom always said I was a sw- could be a swimmer, but I did wrestle. Rather than delighting in God, I was tempted to delight in being recognized and in my accomplishments. It was in choosing a college Rather than delighting in God, I was tempted to delight in a self-made future by going to the right school and getting a job afterwards that would produce a lot of money. It was that actual first job after college. Rather than delighting in God, I was tempted to delight in making money and living the bachelor lifestyle as I traveled the country with no expenses. Honestly, it was last week. (laughs) Rather than delighting in God, I was tempted to delight in what I could acquire. More money, more things, more fame, more, more, more. And once again, Psalm 1 comes to mind, reminding me of what God desires for me and what my delight is should be in. At this time, I'm going to invite one of our students, Jacob Wassinger, to come up to the stage and read Psalm 1 for us. Please take out your copy of God's Word or follow along on the screen as he reads Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, 
but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Thank you, Jacob. This morning, I want to focus on the root of the descriptions that are laid out in this passage, answering the question of why that explains the characteristics being described and the outcomes of each. We can so often see the results, the good things that we will receive within a passage and completely miss the essential root, the cause, the source of the, that produces these results. We are introduced to two types of people within this passage. The righteous, referring to the godly person, one who is following after God, and the wicked, one who is in opposition to God. A strong contrast is being made here to express the idea that there is a large chasm between the two, and one is far more desirable than the other. Remember the contrast used in the movies like Star Wars. The psalmist is using this as well. So what is the root difference between these contrasting lives? Well, let's look back at Psalms 1, verses 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. And we hit this transition, but... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. You'll notice on the screen behind me there are going to be two sections. One detailing the godly person, and one side detailing the wicked person. So what does the passage say about the godly person? Well, first, the godly person follows godly wisdom. We heard about the markers of godly wisdom and worldly wisdom in James 3 by Pastor Than a few weeks ago. Wisdom of the world is characterized as bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, and boasting. Does that sound familiar to what our culture currently pursues or how you would define it? Wisdom from above is marked by purity, peace, gentleness, mercy, full of good fruits. The godly person also pursues a life of righteousness. This image of walking, standing, and sitting within this particular company in verse 1 refers to the increasing association and involvement in a life of sinfulness and down a path of destruction. We again get to this transition, but the godly person delights in obeying God's instruction. And the godly person also pursues a life in relationship to God. We see three words being used here, and I'd like to better define them. First is delight. Second is law, and third is meditates. We can so often think of delight as something that brings happiness. And if you were to look this up uh, in a dictionary, you would also get the same word. However, the delight that is being used here speaks to a deeper idea. One of a desire of the heart, a deep longing after something. Psalm 63 1 says this O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I don't know about you, but I just got really thirsty. When's the last time? You described your desire for God like that. 
Man, those are some colorful words. To seek, to thirst, to faint. But that's what the word delight is referring to. The second word, law, refers to the word of God. We see this word used all throughout Scripture, speaking of God's commandments and his written word to his people. But this also speaks to something deeper as well. The word also infers an action in response to the instructions of God. And that response, that action, is to follow in obedience. The third word is meditates. I'm sure everyone immediately thought of this deep thought and reflection. And while this word does infer to a pondering and a reflection, a meditation over God's word, over the law, it also refers to an actual sound, a muttering or a murmuring that occurs, which infers that it is meant to be read aloud. For context, people at this time did not have access to the full written word like we do today. So they had to often memorize it and ponder it, often reciting it to themselves and to others as a way to know God's word, to hide it in their heart, and be reminded and challenged by it. I hope you are seeing this this action that's taking place. More than just a reading A knowing, but something that travels from our head to our heart and from our heart outwards in our life. When is the last time you delighted in God's word? Proverbs 3, 1 through 4 speaks on this very idea. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace They will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Again, this delighting in and meditating on wasn't just knowing, wasn't just the occasional reading of what God says in his word but evokes a response, an action. James 1, to 25 reminds us of this very idea. In verse 22 it says, But be doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Also in verse 25 it says this, But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, Being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. We're going to take a shift here, and and we're now going to look at what the passage says about the wicked person. We're going to be looking at verse 4, and so please follow along with me. Verse 4, the wicked are not so. Did you catch it? Can you see the contrast again? We see a building contrast through the length of description and the negative word usage compared to the godly person. This takes everything that was just laid out in verses 1 and 2 and infers the opposite to describe the wicked and their delight. And so let's define the wicked person. The wicked person, one, follows worldly wisdom. The wicked person pursues a life of sin. The wicked person delights in disobedience of God's instruction. And the wicked person pursues a life in opposition to God. So we've looked at the root cause, the source, which is the object of our delight. We see that a person who is godly delights in God and pursues a life of obedience 
to him. But for anyone who has any curious bone in their body, I know I do, you ask the question, why? Why should my delight be on God and pursuing a life after him? The psalmist thankfully provides us with the answers. We continue to see this contrast between the godly person and the wicked. In verses 1 through 3, we see that the godly person, when delighting in him and pursuing a life, a relationship with God, first, in verse 1, experiences lasting joy. In verse 1, it says, blessed is the man. The definition of the word being used here infers not just a feeling of happiness, but something deeper. That of lasting joy and gratitude because of the fellowship he has with his God. We're going to look at verse 3, so please follow along with me. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. We see also that the godly person experiences true life. And we're giving this, given this image, this metaphor of a tree who is planted by streams of water, who's yielding fruits in its season, and whose leaves do not wither. The tree imagery was common to those reading it. It was an, often a metaphor used to describe wisdom or the wise. And wisdom was what people in the ancient times sought after. We still do. Additionally, they wanted to understand who God was, their relationship to him, and what it meant to faithfully live for God. A tree being planted represented a life-giving source, a foundation. Yielding fruit represented reward or blessing over one's life. It was a person who delighted in God and pursued a life after him who would experience a life-giving fellowship with him, a life in alignment to his will and lasting fulfillment, joy, and hope. Thirdly, the godly person is in communion with God. And you're probably like, wait a minute, it didn't say anything about communion within verse 3 there. But what I'm referring to is that last portion. In all he does, he prospers. And you're like, wait a minute, but that communion isn't prosperous. It doesn't say success in there. We can often see this word within the text and think, oh, hey, I'm going to have a successful life. I'm going to acquire a lot of wealth, and it's going to be an easy life. Sign me up. This is not what this word is referring to. Now, one may have success within their life and may acquire wealth, but it is no guarantee or assurance. However, this word points to something deeper, a success in God's perspective. And that success is communion with him and his blessing over your life. The wise person is successful because God is with him. In Psalm 73, the psalmist sees the success of the wicked. He sees the prosperity that they're having, even though they're walking away from God, but is reminded when he is in communion with God. And Psalm 73, 17 says this, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. It is there that the psalmist saw the true result of the wicked, and the greatness of being in God's presence, in a relationship with God. Alternatively, we get the results of the wicked again laid out in verse 4. Follow along with me. The wicked are not so. Did you catch it again? 
This again ties all that we was described in verses one through three for the godly person and puts a big, fat, negative sign in front of it. And so this is how the wicked person is described. The wicked person, one, experiences fleeting happiness. The the wicked person experiences false life. Rather than being described as a tree, they are being described as a chaff in the process. And when they're thrown up, the wind drives them away. Thirdly, the wicked person, rather than being in communion with God, is in condemnation under God. The words being used here, again, are intended to create a contrast. Additionally, the description of chaff not being planted, not yielding fruits, and having withering leaves express the wicked person's uselessness, their foolishness, and their destruction. Additionally, the wicked person is not prosperous because he is not in fellowship with God and he is walking in opposition to God's will. Yes, they may experience abundance and success in this life. However, their future is condemnation. Matthew 6 speaks greatly about what we desire, what we are storing up here on this earth, and the result of that. And I would challenge you and encourage you to read that when you have time. Are we more interested in gaining reward, acclaim, and physical wealth here and now? Or is our sights set on what is eternal? The psalmist ends with a contrast of outcomes based on our delight. It begins by defining the wicked's outcome in verses 5 and 6. Please follow along with me. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. We see the wicked person described, their outcomes described, and they are these. The wicked person will be judged in their sin. Whatever success, gain, acclaim, or pursuit these people had on earth, they will be judged in their sin. The wicked person also will be counted as enemies of God. They will not stand in the congregation of the righteous. They will not be counted as God's people who have been justified by faith in Christ. And the wicked person will be separated from God and experience eternal suffering. This speaks not only to a coming destruction, but a separation from the God of the universe and his presence And involves eternal suffering and turmoil. Matthew 13, 50 speaks of this eternal condemnation by describing the suffering that will will occur. It says, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing, gnashing of teeth. Second Thessalonians 1 9 also speaks to the gravity of this outcome. It says, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of of his might. This is a separation from all that is good, holy, and life-giving. 
Doesn't this remind you a little bit about the, the tree imagery that we saw in verse 3? We then see the outcome of the godly person. We see that the godly person will be saved by their faith in Christ. We also see that the godly person will be counted as children of God. And lastly, we will see that the godly person will be with God and experience eternal life. <coughs> John 3.16, a familiar passage to all of us, reminds us of this very promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So why is it so much more desirable to pursue a godly life and to place our delight in God? I believe there are three key reasons presented within this passage. First is that God blesses those who delight in him. And you're probably thinking in your mind all the things that you're going to get from God. But let's remember that there is something deeper happening here. This blessing is a life of lasting joy, lasting fulfillment, and lasting eternal hope. Secondly, secondly we see that God establishes those who delight in him. And we saw this through the imagery of the tree he plants them firmly near a life-giving source, which is himself. He causes them to bear fruit. He sustains its leaves from withering and makes them prosperous in all they do. And finally, in verse 6, we see that God knows those who delight in him. Yes, God is omniscient and he knows all things. He knows what's going on. However, this word is speaking to something deeper. The word used in this passage refers to the act of caring, guarding, having one's eyes fixed on someone. There is not just a knowing about what's happening, but a personal and intimate relationship with God. We only need to go to John 10 to understand this word more clearly. In verses 2 through 4 in John 10, it says, but he who enters the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. In verses 14 through 15 of that same chapter, Jesus says this, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. We've just read through Psalm 1 and saw this contrast between the godly person and the wicked person. The godly person delights in God and pursues a life after him. The wicked person does not, but puts their delight in worldly wisdom and success. Their outcomes, the godly person experiences the presence of God eternally and his blessing over their life. The wicked person experiences eternal separation from God and suffering. Is a pursuit of God and his word what you delight in over everything else? Or is this whole Christian thing just a nice little safety net if things don't work out for you? 
For me, God introduced me to this passage in middle school. And again, by his grace, met me with this passage in high school. It felt like he was standing right in front of me and asking me this question in person. Scott, where is your delight in? Is it me or something else? And at that moment, I couldn't say that it was. But when God intervenes in that way, you can't help but be brought to a place of brokenness and repentance. It was there that God transformed me by his word, through his spirit, to chase after God, rather than what I wanted or what the world was telling me to chase after. It was through this passage that God challenged me to take my faith seriously. It wasn't just a ticket to punch, this safety net, or a fallback plan. This was the life I wanted to pursue because I truly understood who God was. He was good. He was holy. He is life-giving. And he is full of hope. Each one of us is met with the choice of what we will delight in. It is an ongoing challenge and temptation for each of us. We can either choose to put our delight in God or to not delight in God. It's that simple. But God desires for all of us to be in fellowship, in relationship with him, and to put our delight in him alone. It was his intention from the beginning, laid out in the book of Genesis, to have that intimate relationship with us, and to live in the life-giving, fulfilling, and loving care of his presence. But sin has broken that relationship between us and God, and has caused us to delight in the wrong things. If you're in this room today, or maybe you're listening online, that relationship with the God of the universe is available to you. And so maybe you're walking in today and you have that relationship with God, but your delight has been pulled to something other than Him. God, with His loving arms, just as He did with me invites you to repent and to put your delight in him. Or maybe today you walk in and and you don't have a relationship with God or you're trying to still figure out what this all means. He greatly desires for you to experience his character and his presence in your life. And the greatest news of all is that this gift, this relationship with God, is free. And Romans 10:9 gives us a clear understanding of how to accept this free gift. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God rose him from the dead, you will be saved. So wherever you're coming from today and whatever's going on in your life, I encourage you to put your delight in God. At the end of the service, we're going to have prayer partners who are going to be around the worship center here. And maybe you need prayer over something. Maybe you're struggling through something. Or maybe even you're wondering what this whole relationship with God means and how to have that. I would invite you after the service to come speak with one of our prayer partners at the end of the service. They would love to pray for you to walk alongside you with what's going on in your life. And they would be more than happy to talk with you about how you can have a relationship with God and put your delight in him. The invitation is there. However, when our time on earth is over, what we delighted in will determine our eternity. A presence with God and his knowing over us or eternity 
apart from God, void of what is good, holy, life-giving, and filled with eternal suffering and turmoil. So as we end our service this morning, church family, will you choose to delight in God today? A life pursuing God and in fellowship with him is far greater than what anyone or anything else can offer. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity to come and worship you, to exalt your name, and to be challenged and reminded by your word. Thank you for Psalms 1, as it has reminded me over the years of where I should have my delight. I pray today that you would challenge through your spirit the hearts and minds in this room to re-examine where we have our delight, whether it is on you or on something other than you. God, would you transform us so that we would be different when we leave than when we came in here. God, you are good, you are holy, you are life-giving, and you are full of hope. And we give you the praise and glory for that. And we ask all of this in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going to end with one more song. So if you're comfortable standing, we'll close the service out.
Thank you so much for joining us today, Southwest. It was great to see you all. Have a wonderful week. We're excited to see you throughout the week, and we'll see you soon.